thank you, Nargis, uh, for introducing me. Uh, I'm also grateful to my colleagues uh, for mentioning uh, the fact that human nature is probably immutable. You don't hear me, but I don't hear my voice, but I don't hear this. Um, and uh, also, um, that point uh, regarding propaganda, I don't mention the term propaganda in s itself in my presentation, but in a sense it's about propaganda, mostly propaganda uh, related to the Ukrainian conflict we are witnessing right now. Um, next time. You, may, you may go all the way. So um, uh, there is no doubt that uh, there has been serious concerns uh, raised about the Russian behavior in the Ukraine uh, by the international community. And uh, I, I would like uh, not to understand my argument as something anti-Russian. Um, it is true that, uh, for instance, um, uh, the United States behaved on many occasions not quite too well, and uh, uh, my students are aware that I have been criticizing the United States for that uh, as well, for instance, uh, the war in Iraq. Um, my, my presentation will be a little bit political, but I, I still believe it will be neutral, as we were asked by the convener of, of this uh, round table. So I will try to look at uh, some sources behind why Russia behaves vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine the way it behaves. I will try to look briefly at the, the political system in the Ukraine and distribute uh, in, in Russia, sorry, and um, the distribution of power in Russia, and what place, uh, especially the official media, uh, play in in Russia. I will briefly look at uh, the role of uh, Vladimir Putin himself, uh, and. Uh, well, th we won't have time to uh, talk too much about whether there are any other options uh, Russia might have, or what Russia should should do to uh, to promote her own interests. And this is what Russia and Putin uh, are arguing that what they do in the Ukraine is uh, in their own interest. Next, please. Um, well, uh, the, the, this is the question we uh, often discuss in international relations classes, and that's um, uh, what exactly or why states are behaving uh, the way they are behaving. We generally believe that uh, States behave the way they behave because they believe it is in their interest to behave that well, uh, that way. But there, there is a question: uh, Who is the state, and who in, whose interest that state promotes? Obviously, state uh, is not a person; uh, it's a set of institutions. But behind that set of institutions, there are groups of people with particular interests. And uh, uh, this comes to a fore, especially in countries like Russia, 
which are not much democratic and uh, where, for instance, I guess you will get to that uh, later more, where official institutions don't play such an uh, important role as informal institutions. The, the other question, of course, is uh, what is the real interest of Russia and uh, what is the long-term interest of Russia? Um, very tentatively, and not going into all those theories we are usually discussing in uh, international relations classes, we may say that the behavior of a state is a result of some sort of combination of interests of key actors, especially of the elites, the character of the whole political system, political leaders, some historical traject trajectories, that means the role, historic perception of history plays in, in that nation state, and uh, of course the whole international situation uh, plays its role too. Uh, next, please. Um, well, um, the, that question, is Russia a democracy? Who believes Russia is a democracy? See, not so many people. Well, we, we mostly agree that Russia is not a democratic um, country, not even Russians believe in that. Uh, they, they are using that term managed democracy. In the West we would say if it might be seen as having some elements of democracy, it would rather be sort of electoral democracy, although we know that not even elections in Russia are quite democratic. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a real Western type democracy. And uh, the role of the uh, elites, political and economic elites, or powerful oligarchic groups in Russia is uh, more pronounced than in other countries, especially because Russia is not a democracy and a lot of functionings of the whole system uh, relies more on various informal, uh, I would say, uh, para-constitution institutions, uh, something uh, like a state council, or civic chamber, and so on in Russia, institutions not mentioned in the constitution. And uh, uh, the whole system relies on the informal networks of uh, uh, elites connections and so on, more than on official constitutional institutions. Um, well, uh, the other question or point which is mentioned here is that relations between the whole system and uh, the political culture in Russia. We will get to that later because we, we know that both Putin and the whole system has got quite uh, a significant support of uh, Russia's population. Well, um, to many people it's quite intriguing why after some period, especially at the beginning of the 1990s and uh, attempts from both uh, sides, that means the West and Russia, uh, later in the 2000s, uh, Russia started to drift away from the West and in fact assumed quite anti-Western position. Some are related to the fact of uh, the color, color revolutions, Georgia, Ukraine, the Kosovo affair, in which uh, 
Russia strongly supported Serbia and the fact of NATO enlarging into especially the Baltic countries. Uh, recently there has been a lot of uh, scholarly work on uh, trying to explain the, this new assertiveness of Russia. And uh, uh, there are books on uh, how much uh, Russia is uh, interested in, in, this, in its status as world's superpower, uh, how uh, important role emotions, for instance, play in Russian foreign policy, symbols, and so on. Um, Yeah, well, then uh, that might become uh, quite a problem when uh, we see that, uh, um, for instance, emotions play a more important role than uh, a rational assessment of the situation. We will probably get back to that. Uh, and. Uh, Well, we, we, we know, and people who follow the international media, you might be aware that uh, Russia is somehow trying to split uh, the Western uh, position against uh, Russia, uh, through both through its diplomacy and uh, the uh, media. I will go just very briefly through that. Most of uh, uh, scholars believe that Russian media are not quite free. This, in fact, uh, is evident in, uh, in the ranking of many international organizations. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, that's, I believe, World Bureau of uh, uh, our research Bureau of Journalism believes that Russia is very close to the end of the ranking of uh, media freedom. There has been a lot of uh, journalists killed in Russia as, as well. Um, however, in the Russian constitution, the freedom of press is uh, still guaranteed. Next, uh, Quite telling is uh, also a look at the ownership structure of Russian media. Most of the official media are somehow connected and especially controlled by the state. We will see it on, on the picture uh, on, on the next slide. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a graphic. Uh, um, description of the hands of the uh, Russian government in most of the uh, uh, mainstream and uh, important media in uh, Russia. We, we know that there are still some um, more or less independent uh, media like Novaya Gazeta, or I believe there is still that uh, TV channel Dost. But most of the official media, especially TV, are really owned by, uh, in one way or another, owned and controlled by Russian government. And especially that goes about TV. And we know that uh, more than 90% of Russians take their information from TV. Well, this is a, a, a little bit a breakdown of how that control of media uh, works. Uh, and the media are controlled and uh, repressed both by selective uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, regulations. Uh, very often some media outlets are being uh, 
uh, executed uh, because of some financial, alleged financial irregularities and so on. In uh, worst cases, independent journalists may be imprisoned on false charges and uh, uh, and so on. Next slide. Um, well, this is uh, uh, what official state media use as uh, propaganda. Uh, it's part of propaganda. Um, and sometimes it's, it's very interesting instruments. We have seen uh, some of them mentioned here by my predecessor speaker. Uh, and it's uh, uh, something which uh, you, can, uh, you can witness uh, almost every day uh, in the Russian media. One story having several different versions Nobody then knows what is exactly the truth. Some versions or narratives, as, as I use their terms, are sometimes quite contradictory, um, and so on. Next slide. Uh, some mentioned that there might be a difference between coverage of uh, uh, the uh, events in the Ukraine um, between the official media and uh, uh, the unofficial social networks. Well, that, that might be true, although the official Russian uh, control is trying to penetrate um, unofficial um, social networks as well. But as, as I mentioned, most of the people Ordinary Russians take their information from TV anyway. Um, yeah, well, um, this is a, this is a statement taken from my class. Um, we were trying to discuss this: uh, if the state controls most of the media. This, this might remind us of some other countries as well. And if the state mainstream media, official media outlets, support your state's position, this contributes to the stability of the country and society. Is this true? Yeah, well, a lot of people, a lot of my students usually agree with that. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, if, if I ask the same question in Canada or in Czech Republic, most people wouldn't quite understand what I talk about. Why should state uh, has some official media outlets? doesn't exist in Canada or in the Czech Republic, right, for instance. Right. Um, but well, it's, it's, you, you may think about that and uh, you may have some interesting thoughts about that. Right, next slide. Um, yeah, well, I, I will be mentioning uh, shortly a little bit uh, those different narratives about the events in the Ukraine. I won't be talking uh, at all about the role of Putin in um, uh, forming the policy against the Ukraine and the role of his personality. But we know that personality played quite an important role in the history. And this is why some scholars try to analyze uh, psychology uh, of uh, political leaders. There's been a, a lot of uh, interesting uh, books and articles recently about Putin himself, why he reacts and responds to many situations the way he, he does. Um, many people believe that uh, there must be some sort of 
complex of inferiority involved in his uh, personality. Uh, anyway, um, try to find out uh, some information about his childhood. It's very telling too. Uh, next, please. Um, and uh, of course, uh, I didn't mention, I assume that most of you are aware of uh, the Putin's past in uh, the KGB and secret services and so on. Now, um, recently a lot of scholars operate with this term, narrative, and uh, I, I believe it might be uh, useful for us uh, to um, what, what, what is narrative? What we understand by a narrative? But maybe, yeah. uh, maybe if you take some fact or um, historical event and you try to use it in your own interest, and uh, actually in this case, uh, you try you put this anywhere you want and use this uh, as a um, your argument again and again. You are absolutely right. It's probably even more simple than that. It's, it's a term that comes from literary science and it means uh, uh, to tell a story from a particular uh, perspective or explaining some events or information from a particular perspective. And you probably yourself might be aware of that if you and your friend go through any sort of activity or accident, whatever, then shortly after, if you are telling what happened, it might be quite substantially different from what your friend is telling about the same. Right. And. Uh, uh, this is what is happening in, especially in uh, wartime situations. And I am not uh, using that term my colleague was using. And that's a good term, framing. Yeah. Particular events might be framed in several different ways. And uh, then they compete for readers' attention, credibility, and so on. Next, please. Um, this is, in, in, in fact, uh, how um, Russians are affected by the media. And uh, uh, you can see that when the events in the Ukraine started, both satisfactions of Russian with the direction in which the, uh, their country is and uh, the and the popularity of uh, uh, Putin as president skyrocketed, and uh, that's uh, the combination of the effect of Russian political culture and the media. Next slide. Um, here we have those two basic narratives about what is happening in the Ukraine. First we have Ukrainian uh, official narrative. This is what uh, uh, most Ukrainians believe that their country has been going through. Right? A democratic revolution, um, and that Crimea was uh, illegally annexed by Russia and that Russia is illegally starting a rebellion, so-called, in eastern Ukraine. However, if you look at the Russian official narrative, you will see it's, uh, it's something quite uh, different. Right. And both are covering the same historical period. Next slide. Um, 
So what are some key themes in the Russian narrative? First, um, uh, Russians believe that the brothers, um, Belarusian Ukrainians, brothers belong to the same civilization and uh, they should be united on the, the Russian world. Uh, um, they also believe, and especially this, uh, this is quite evident from uh, Putin's speeches, that Western cannot be an example to Russia. West, the West, especially Western Europe and the United States, are both decadent, immoral, wicked, and so on, act in their own interest and against the interest of uh, Russia. And the West is trying to humiliate Russia. Next. Um, and uh, um, with regard to the Ukraine, um, the official Russian narrative, we already mentioned that, um, is uh, quite contrary to the Russian, uh, to the Ukrainian narrative. The Russian narrative believes that there are fascists in Ukraine um, and uh, that uh, um, whatever Russia is doing in the Ukraine is quite legitimate uh, to help uh, Russian speakers in the Ukraine and that, for instance, Crimea historically belongs to Russia. Next. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's in a sense a little bit of mystery why Russia is somehow driving into this kind of geopolitical confrontation with the West. I personally believe that uh, there are several factors here. And uh, first, that's uh, Russians or interest of some powerful groups, elite groups in Russia, um, especially uh, those related to political elites or economic elites and also to Siloviki uh, or to what, what uh, I the army and the security services. Um, many people believe. Uh, can, can, can oh yeah, that we've got it here. Um, many people believe that uh, um, the most important factor in Russia's behavior is fear, and that's fear of losing power. Uh, what would happen to those people who amassed billions of dollars in uh, by by means not quite legal uh, if there is any dramatic change of the course in Russia? So the fear of losing power might be behind uh, many of uh, um, actions by Russia. There is nothing ideological in, in, in that. Right? We don't see ideology to be any important factor in Russia's behavior. Uh, but if, if you consider nationalism or will to stay in power as sort of ideology, then that would be a little bit different, but um, that would be it. Um, also, there is the, this factor of self-enforcing and reinforcing narratives. That means when you uh, believe in something, in particular interpretation of the events or situation, or your own situation, uh, then anything what fits in that situation and that narrative, your explanation, would be good for you. Right. And uh, yeah, well, uh, 
I, I, I guess we are getting to the conclusion. Um, you may skip, please. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I believe, some sort of uh, uh, con conclusion. Um, and a quotation from Putin. Uh, and he's saying that quite bluntly, that uh, Russia should stay uh, or should become a geopolitical power, superpower again, and uh, it has to do uh, anything what it takes for that. Uh, and that uh, Western countries are denying Russia this role. Well, that's something what to, uh, it's a mistake, to think about whether this is really true. Uh, I guess there is one more slide. Uh, oh, no, no. Uh, uh, so um, we may think about what might be, whether what Russia is doing in the Ukraine, whether this is really in the interest of Russia. I personally believe it's not. I, I, I believe it's damaging interest of Russia. But I would like other people to think about that as well. Thank you.